Welcome to the second part of our genetics revision videos. In the last video, we looked at the monohybrid cross. And what we're going to do in this video is to look at applications of that and variations on that. So we're going to start by talking about the types of dominance. The monohybrid cross that we've looked at so far involves what we call complete dominance. In complete dominance, one allele is always completely dominant over another. And the recessive allele, according to Mendel's law of dominance, is only visible if there is no dominant gene pr present. So in the example here, we have a red flower crossed with white flowers, and the result is red flowers, but they are heterozygous for that condition. Incomplete dominance is where there is no recessive. There are only dominant alleles. But because there are two dominant alleles, now we're faced with well, which one gets shown up, which one is expressed. And the answer is that they're both expressed. But the way in which they're expressed is that they're expressed as a blend. So again, if we look at our red flowers crossed with our white flowers, instead of having red flowers, we have pink. Because pink is a blend, it's an intermediate phenotype of red and white. When it comes to writing these things down in the monohybrid cross template, instead of having a capital letter and a small letter to represent the dominant and the recessive, Instead, we have two capital letters of different letters. So you can see there for the red, it would be capital R, capital R. And the white, instead of being small r, small r, is now written as capital W, capital W. That indicates to you that we're dealing with something other than complete dominance. The intermediate, which is the heterozygous condition, in this case is not capital R, small r, it's now capital R capital W. Everything else in that monohybrid cross template remains the same. The only thing that's different is the letters that you use for the different alleles. What you should note in the exam is that if they give you a color that is a hyphenated word, for example, um, green blue, or orange yellow, or uh, red pink, that indicates the intermediate color. So this is what your Punnett square would look like in your monohybrid cross. So if the parent is capital R, capital R, that if, remember, according to Mendel, that is the term pure breeding. According to genetics as we know it now, that is homozygous dominant. Crossed with a white flower, capital W, capital W, homozygous dominant or pure breeding. When we look at those genes and we put them into the different um, chromosome, into the different gametes, sorry, we would have capital R and capital R, and down the side, capital W and capital W. When you put those together in your Punnett square, you get RW, which is the phenotype, not red, but pink. Another exception to the rule is codominance. Now for codominance, we've still got two different letters that we're gonna use, capital R and capital W, and both of them are dominant. There is no recessive. But this time, instead of these two dominant alleles being expressed as a blend, they're going to be expressed separately. So here again, we have a red flower crossed with a white flower, but this time instead of RW being pink, RW indicates red and white. In the exam, the way that this will be indicated is by the use of a new word, for example, checkered or rowan. So a word that you might not have come across before, that indicates to you that you're dealing with a co-dominant situation where two colors or two phenotypes are visible independently of each other, but at the same time. So let's look at some examples. Cattle, for example. The word rowan means that for any animal, the fur color is a predominant color, but mixed in with that, you will find a second color. So here we have a brown cow crossed with a white cow, and the offspring are white with brown spots. Uh, or you might have patches of white and patches of brown. Again, the Punnett square is exactly as normal. One parent on the one side, the other parent on the other side. The difference from the normal monohybrid cross template or the normal Punnett square is that we're using two different letters. Both of them are capital. And that when we put that into the Punnett square and we get the F1 generation, that heterozygous condition, the RW condition, is not a blend, 
and it's not the dominant. It is both colors visible at the same time. This is what it looks like in chickens. So in chickens, we refer to checkered chickens. Doesn't mean that they actually have a check pattern on them, like you know, plaid clothing or something like that. It means that each feather has both colors present. So if you look at this photo, you can see that each feather is white with a black trim. That is the checkered color or the checkered phenotype. So again, we've got the black chicken, which gives us B and B as our uh, alleles. The white chicken gives us W and W as our alleles for our gametes. And the heterozygous condition of the F1, BW, it's not black, it's not gray, it's checkered. BW, both expressed, both visible at the same time, but independently of each other. This is what co-dominance looks like in flowers. So here you can see clearly the two different colors, both being expressed, but separately from each other. There's no blending going on here. So to summarize, most of the examples that you're going to get are going to be complete dominance, where you have a dominant allele and a recessive allele. In those situations, you use a capital letter for the dominant, small letter for the recessive. And the heterozygous condition is always going to be, in the phenotype, the dominant. So here we've got red crossed with white, and with the F1, we would have red offspring. With incomplete dominance, we use two different letters, both of them are capital, R and W, and the offspring are going to be a blend. That heterozygous condition, RW, is going to be pink. In co-dominant, we still use the two letters, two separate letters, capital R and capital W, but this time, instead of the offspring being a blend of the phenotype, you see both colors independently in the phenotype. So there you can see those petunias, red center, white margins. Another situation in which you could be asked to do a monohybrid cross is in sex determination. You already know from your uh, genetics section that we've already done and from meiosis that there are, and from your DNA section, that there are 23 pairs of chromosomes in human beings. 22 of those are your autosomes and the third pair, your gonosomes, are the ones that determine your gender, your sex. Now for human beings, XX is female and XY is male. Just note that that's not the case in other species. So for other species, XY is female and XX is male. But in human beings, XX is female, XY is male. So they might ask you to do a monohybrid cross to show how it is that whenever human beings have children, there is always a 50% chance that the child will be a boy or 50% chance that the child will be a girl. This is what your monohybrid cross template would look like. Remember, you get marks for putting in the words meiosis and fertilization and for putting in the, the symbols P1 and F1, provided, of course, that they're all in the correct place. So you can see here, when you look at your Punnett square, because the mother can only give Xs and because the father can give an X and a Y, 50% of the F1 generation are going to be female and 50% 50, 50 of, the of the F1 generation are going to be male. They're very likely to combine that sort of question with a question looking at karyotypes. Now, a human karyotype is simply the number uh, of your chromosomes or the physical appearance of those chromosomes. Uh, usually it's presented in this kind of format where you've got a photograph of the chromosomes with each chromosome has been cut out and paired up with its partner, with its homologous pair. So you can see the 22 that are your autosomes. And then the 23rd pair, which are your gonosomes, indicating male and female. Now on that 23rd pair, there are genes that are linked to each other, obviously. Most of the time it's not a problem, but what happens when a gene that occurs on the X chromosome doesn't occur on the Y because the Y is missing an arm? The gonosomes are not homologous. This is because the Y uh, chromosome is missing an arm, which means it's missing some genes. It doesn't have a copy of every single gene that is on the X chromosome. And this means that there is some linkage between your sex and the genes that you have. Imagine a situation where on the X chromosome, you've either got a recessive allele or you've got a mutated allele. 
if you don't have a backup copy, if you don't have that second X chromosome, which has another copy of that gene, which might have the healthy allele, then you've only got that one allele that can be expressed. So women in general tend to have fewer sex-linked disorders because they have a second chromosome, a second X. But males tend to have more because they don't have that second X chromosome. So if they inherit a faulty gene or a recessive allele on their X chromosome, they don't have a backup copy that can be expressed or used instead. Now, when we talk about sex-linked notation and when we do the monohybrid cross for a, for a gene that is sex-linked, there is a different notation that we have to use. Because we're talking about the 23rd pair, you've got to indicate whether it is XY for male or XX for female. You need to indicate that to your markers. But you also need to indicate what the allele is that is present on that chromosome. And so we use additional letters in the index position, in the indices position, up at the top on the right. Now, in the example of hemophilia, hemophilia is a blood clotting disorder where you don't produce clotting factors. That means that if you get cut or you get a bruise, you can actually bleed to death from a paper cut, essentially. It doesn't always work that way, but essentially you can, you can bleed to death any time you break or burst a blood vessel. So capital H indicates a normal person, a person who produces those clotting factors and does not suffer with hemophilia. Little h is the recessive. Okay, now the moment that we've got a recessive, this immediately tells you we're talking about complete dominance. So if we have a completely healthy female, she will have two normal genes. So we use two capital H's next to her X's. If she's an affected female, she will have two small H's. And again, we indicate that in the index position on both chromosomes. But if she's heterozygous, capital H, small h, then we call her a carrier. This is her genotype, not her phenotype. What it means is, in practice, she will be perfectly healthy. She will not have hemophilia. However, because she carries that gene, that recessive allele, she can pass it on to her offspring. And if she has a boy, particularly because he only inherits one X chromosome, he will have that disorder. If you have a normal male, there's a capital H on the X, and notice there's nothing written next to the Y. And that is because this gene doesn't exist on the Y chromosome. Boys only have one copy of this gene because the X and the Y chromosomes are not homologous. If the boy is affected, he will have a small H, he will have the recessive allele on his X chromosome. Again, notice there's nothing written in the index position next to the Y because this gene doesn't exist on the Y chromosome. A heterozygous condition for the female, she will be completely normal in her phenotype, but in her genotype, she is a carrier. And secondly, just to stress again, we do not write any allele or gene next to the Y chromosome. Let's have a look at a practical example. So we have a normal mother and an affected father. We're going to assume at this point that the mother is homozygous dominant. The father being affected is going to have the recessive allele. Remember, no little letter next to the Y. Meiosis takes place and then we look at our gametes. The mother can give those two gametes. The father can give an affected gamete or the Y gamete. So we put those into our Punnett square. And again, remember, it doesn't matter whether you put the father at the top and the mother down the side or the mother at the top and the father down the side. So for our genotype, you can see here that we're going to have two normal males. So if they have a boy, the boy is going to be normal. And that makes sense because the boy is going to get his X chromosome from his mother and his mother is perfectly healthy. However, if they have girls, those girls are going to be carriers. So in their phenotype, they're perfectly normal, perfectly healthy. You wouldn't know that there's anything wrong with them. But when you look at their genes, they are carrying that recessive allele. 
So the genotype here is one to one, x big H, x little h, to x big H, y. And in terms of the phenotype, we have, you could either say 100% normal, because those girls are normal in their phenotype, or if you want to separate it into boys and girls, you could say 50% normal girls, 50% normal boys. But what happens if the mother is a carrier? So she has a healthy gene and she has a recessive gene. That's our P1 generation. There we can see their chromosomes. You can see that she has one chromosome that has the healthy gene, one chromosome with the recessive gene. Notice that on the Y chromosome, that gene doesn't exist. So the man only has one copy. Now you can use these arrows and the arrow formation rather than using a Punnett square if you find it easier. I find the Punnett square easier. So we get the F1 generation and you can see how she can have, this couple can have one girl who's perfectly normal and healthy, another girl who is a carrier, she has one recessive allele, a normal boy and an affected boy. Now this works whether you are talking about hemophilia, whether you're talking about red-green color blindness, whether you're talking about Huntington's chorea, whether you're talking about a whole bunch of, of different disorders that are sex linked. Let's look at a third example. What happens if the mother is a carrier and she doesn't know that she's a carrier and she marries somebody who's affected? So in this case, we're looking at the color blindness. So they're the P1 generation, there are their genes. We go through meiosis and fertilization and we get the F1 generation. So now we can see that she has a daughter who is a carrier and a daughter who is affected a son who is normal, a son who is affected. So 25% chance of each of those uh, individuals occurring. Notice too, it's not impossible for a girl to have a sex-linked disorder. All that needs to happen is that her father has to have the disorder, whatever it is, and her mother has to be a carrier for that disorder. Another way in which we might use the monohybrid cross is in blood grouping. So I'm sure that you're aware of the four human blood groups. There are other blood groups for other species. So we have blood groups A, B, A, B, and O. Those are actually our phenotypes, not our genotypes. For the genotype, again, we use this odd notation where we use a letter and then an index. So for the letter, we use an I this time. It stands for immunoglobin. So we use an I. And but in the power position, in the index position, you would then put the gametes, or the alleles rather, uh, that give that particular phenotype. So you can be homozygous dominant, there, or you can be heterozygous. You can be homozygous dominant or heterozygous. Now these two are special. Blood group O experiences complete dominance in relation to blood groups A and B. And we indicate the recessive alleles for O with these two little eyes. Hence, that's why this heterozygous condition has capital I, big A, small i. That small i is the recessive allele. But AB the blood group A and blood group B are actually co-dominant with each other. When we look at the blood of a person who has blood group AB, we can see A proteins and we can see the B proteins expressed independently of each other. They're not blended to form a C protein. You can see the A's, you can see the B's. I'll come back to that in a moment. So here you can see blood group A with its representative proteins on the outside, in this case, little purple circle. With blood group B, we've represented that with these little green diamonds. Blood group AB, I can see the purple circles and I can see the little green diamonds. And blood group O doesn't actually produce any of those proteins at all. Now the fact that blood group O doesn't produce any of those proteins 
is why when it comes to blood donation, you have to test to know which blood group you're in. Because if you get the wrong protein on that blood group, your immune system will attack that blood and will destroy it. Blood group O, the phenotype, because it has the recessive alleles and therefore doesn't produce those proteins, blood group O can actually donate to anybody. The immune system won't react to it. But if any of the other blood groups try and donate to O, because of the fact that they have these proteins on the outside, which O doesn't have, the immune system will recognize that and will attack that blood and destroy it. And in the process, can kill that person. So blood group O can only receive blood from another person with blood group O. Blood group AB can donate blood to blood group AB. They can't donate to anybody else because the protein mixture on the outside of their red blood cells is different and the immune system will recognize it and kill it, destroy it. However, blood group AB can receive blood from anybody. O doesn't produce proteins, so the immune system won't, won't recognize it. AB is the same as the individual, so the immune system will be fine. B will be fine because there's a B present in AB, and so its immune system recognizes those B proteins. And likewise with A, there is an A present in AB, and so the immune system will recognize those A proteins, and so it doesn't react against either of them. Let's do an example. The woman has blood type A and she's heterozygous. Her partner has blood type B and he is heterozygous. What are the chances of their baby having blood type O? All right, so we are looking here at blood group. And we're going to use IA to represent blood group A, IB to represent blood group B, little i to represent O, and we should probably put in a protein. I, A, I, B to represent A, B. Okay. The mother is blood group A. The father is blood group B. Notice we don't write the heterozygous in because this is the phenotype. In the genotype, however, we put in the heterozygous condition. Meiosis takes place and we get these possible alleles in the gametes, which we now fill in to our Punnett square and complete. When you look at that now, your genotype, you're going to have a one to one to one to one to one condition. So we've got one, one to one to one to one, IA to IB to IAB to little i. The phenotype is going to be 25% A, 25% B. 25% AB, 25% little i. Remember that you still need to answer the question. So the question says, what are the chances their baby will be blood type O? So underneath your, your uh, template here, you still need to write a sentence out beneath that and say, the chances of their baby having blood type O will be 25%. You need to put that concluding sentence in. At this point, it's worth pointing out polygenic traits. We mentioned them in the last video, and I want to show you the Punnett squares that go with that. So a poly polygenic trait is one in which more than one gene is responsible for a characteristic. Height is one of those, skin color is another. When you look at the number of genes that are involved, each gene can have multiple alleles. You develop a range of phenotypes where it's difficult to tell the difference between them. There are three genes that code for skin color, and each of those three genes has two alleles. When we look at the F2 generation, 
So we take the F1 where there's heterozygous conditions, and we take the F2. You can see that there are actually 64 possible combinations of those three genes. You still have to factor in environment because the amount of exposure that you have to sunlight also plays a role. Now, if you have too much vitamin, no, too much retinol, if you have too much retinol in your diet, so in other words, if you eat too many carrots, that will have an impact on your skin color. So there are a whole lot of different uh, environmental factors that also factor into your skin color. Looking at skin color, though, there are 64, a minimum of 64 different genotypes for skin color, giving us a range from albinism all the way through to extremely dark, really black skin. When we looked at test crosses, working backwards from information that you're given to determine the genotype of a parent or a grandparent, you are often asked that kind of question in the context of a pedigree. Now, pedigrees are kind of like family trees, except that we're looking at genetics rather than names of individuals. So a pedigree diagram traces your inheritance of a particular trait over multiple generations. There's some notation that you need to know to be able to interpret these diagrams. We use squares for males and circles for females. And if it's partially shaded in, that indicates a heterozygous condition. If it's completely shaded in, that indicates the recessive condition. And obviously all the lines represent the relationships between the individuals. So if we look at a pedigree diagram for hemophilia, here we've got four generations represented, great-grandparents, grandparents, parents, and children, or parents, children, great-grandchildren, uh, and great-grandchildren, however you want to phrase it. Pause the video and see if you can fill in the genotypes for each of the keys. Uh, so the three circles for the three different types of female and the two squares for the two different males. And then play the video again to see if you got it right. Did you get it right? I bet you forgot to use the correct notation. Remember, hemophilia is a sex-linked trait, meaning that you have to use the special notation of X's and Y's to indicate the gonosomes. Having said that, did you get the powers, the indices, correct? Remember, there's no uh, gene on the Y chromosome for hemophilia because that gene doesn't exist on the Y chromosome. Is carrier female a phenotype or a genotype? Can you remember? It's a genotype. When you're doing a monohybrid cross, when you get to the F1 generation or the F2 generation, and you've got a heterozygous female, remember that that is a genotype. In the phenotype, she is normal. Here's another example, looking at hair color. Pause the video, see if you can fill in the genotypes correctly. And this time it's not sex linked, so you can just use the ordinary complete dominance method. Did you get them right? Let's work backwards and see how we got these different things. We know that blonde is the recessive because of the key that they've given us. This individual is blonde, so it must be small b, small b. Each of those small b's comes from a different parent. So one comes from the one parent and the other comes from the other parent. So even though these parents have brown hair, we can work out that they are both a heterozygous condition because their offspring has the recessive condition. This one is easy because we know that it's the recessive. With this individual, we're not sure whether it's, we're not sure whether the second allele is the recessive or the dominant because we don't have any further generations to compare to. We know that this individual has brown hair, so there must be one capital B, but we're not sure what the second one is. Moving on from monohybrid crosses. One of the things that we need to discuss in relation to genetics is mutations. Mutations are changes in the genetic composition of an organism. In other words, changes in the DNA. Most of them occur spontaneously as a result of some sort of outside influence on the DNA. Things like radiation, when you go for an X-ray, the only mutations that can be passed on are the ones that occur inside the gonad. So when gametes are forming. If a mutation in your DNA occurs somewhere else in the body, you cannot pass that on to your offspring.
you could have mutations that occur at a chromosome level. So for example, something called trisomy. Trisomy, remember back to your meiosis section, is where non-disjunction occurs during anaphase, either anaphase one or anaphase two. And the result is that you have the incorrect number of chromosomes in the gamete, either too many or too few. So with trisomy, we have an extra one or we are, are short of one. A gene mutation simply means that the nucleotide sequence is different. And in many cases, if you think back to your DNA section, uh, and if you think back to protein synthesis section, in many cases, changing the nucleotide base actually doesn't change the protein that is coded for, because there are so many uh, duplicates of the codes for particular proteins. However, you can get harmful uh, mutations where the protein is no longer coded for, and you can also get useful mutations where a new protein is coded for that is actually beneficial. Some examples. If we imagine that all of these three letter words represent the codons on your DNA. The fat cat ate the rat. That's our original. If we change one letter and we make it say the fat cat ate the rat, that may have no bearing whatsoever on the protein that is being formed because CAT and HAT may both code for the same protein. Remember from your DNA that codons are red in groups of three. If we remove that letter, the C of cat, that's what we call a frame shift mutation because then in reading the codons, the three nucleotide bases that are read together shifts. And that means that from then on, for the rest of that gene, there is a different sequence and that means a different protein. That protein may be non-functional or it might be beneficial. An insertion is where we insert a letter or an entire codon. The fat bet cat ate the rat. Again, it's going to change the protein that is coded for. If we delete an entire codon, the fat ate the rat, that again is going to change the entire protein. And sometimes we get something called an inversion. An inversion is where we reverse the whole sequence. So you can see the fat and then the cat is right at the end of the sentence reading backwards that too is going to change the protein. Diseases that are caused by recessive alleles and mutations that you need to be aware of and be able to work with in the exam are hemophilia, red-green color blindness, and Down syndrome, which is trisomy 21. The trisomy 21 question, the way in which this is usually asked is that you are given a karyotype and you are expected to identify what the problem is. So if you look at these two karyotypes, if we look at the male, we can see pair 23, the X and the Y, but you can see at pair 21, there are actually three chromosomes at pair 21. That's a trisomy three. Oh, sorry, trisomy meaning three at pair 21. You can get trisomies at other, pair, at other chromosome pairs, but just be careful and just check carefully when they give you a karyotype. Make sure that you haven't missed something. Likewise, the female, bottom right there, 47XX plus 21. So instead of this being a female that is perfectly normal, she has three chromosomes in position 21. So that's what the plus 21 means. It doesn't mean we've added an extra 21 chromosomes. It's telling you which pair the extra chromosome is at. How does this happen? So in meiosis one, if you have a non-disjunction taking place, this chromosome pair here, instead of one chromosome going to the right and one chromosome going to the left, they both go to the left. The result is that you are missing that chromosome in one of the gametes. When the last pair then separate, when the chromatids separate and move to opposite poles, this one is going to have an extra chromatid. And this one is going to be lacking a chromatid. So this is N plus one, this is N minus one. Non-disjunction can also occur at anaphase two. So anaphase one, we get normal disjunction taking place. But then at anaphase two, we get non-disjunction taking place in one of those two cells. 
this cell is still normal. And so these two gametes are normal. They're the normal haploid cells. But because non-disjunction took place in anaphase two, this gamete has an extra chromosome, N plus one, and this gamete is lacking a chromosome, it's N minus one. In the exam, you are expected to be able to identify if the non-disjunction has taken place in anaphase one or anaphase two. They will give you a diagram, which you will need to study very closely to be able to determine whether the non-disjunction took place in anaphase one, in which case all four gametes are affected, or whether it took place in anaphase two, in which case only two of the gametes are affected. Genetic engineering is where we make use of biotechnology to benefit us as human beings, to improve our lives in some way. In other words, to satisfy some need that we feel we have. Genetic engineering makes use of stem cells, which are small, unspecialized cells. You remember in grade 10, when we did tissues, both in plant tissues and in animal tissues, you have undifferentiated cells called stem cells. Where we get those stem cells from for research purposes is possibly from an embryo. And for that, we use embryos that are five days old. Or from fetal tissue, you could get it from the umbilical cord or the placenta when the baby is born. You could also get it during an amniocentesis where a very long needle is inserted into the abdomen, into the uterus, and into the amniotic fluid floating around the baby. Uh, when you extract that fluid, it will have some stem cells floating in it. You could also get it from aborted fetuses, or you could get it from embryos from in vitro fertilization. That's fertilization in what we would call test tube babies. Uh, so when you, you do in vitro fertilization, you always produce more embryos than you're ever going to use or re-implant back into the donor. Adults do have stem cells. In fact, almost all of your organs have some kind of stem cell. And so you could get stem cells from them. Stem cells are very useful because we can use them for human testing without actually testing them on humans. This avoids the need for animal testing, or it certainly reduces the need for animal testing. The hope is that stem cells can also be modified to replace damaged and diseased tissues. For example, if you've got a spinal injury or for growing your own organ if you need an organ transplant. Because obviously if you take a transplant from somebody else for the rest of your life, you have to take those anti-rejection medications which suppress your immune system. So if you could have an organ transplant and that wasn't necessary, that would be a bonus. But there are problems with stem cells. Even though the use of human tissue is much better than being able to test on an animal because it's human, it doesn't give you the same feedback in terms of how the different systems work together. Think of homeostasis. What affects one organ will affect another. And if you're working in isolation, you have no idea how the medication that you're testing is going to impact on you as an organism, as a whole individual. But if it means we can reduce testing on animals, isn't that a good thing? What about embryos that are produced for IVF? If they're not re-implanted into the mother and they sit in the freezer for the rest of their existence, would it not be better to use them for some moral purpose, from some higher, higher good? Certainly, if an embryo is not used and the woman has decided she's, going, she's had enough children, those embryos are usually just incinerated. They're burnt as medical waste. They don't hang around forever. There is a difference between embryonic and fetal stem cells and adult stem cells. Adult stem cells are only able to develop into very limited ranges of cells. So if you have a blood stem cell, it can only produce blood cells. If you have a muscle stem cell, it can only produce different types of muscle. But when you look at embryonic stem cells, embryonic stem cells can become anything. So a single embryonic stem cell could become nervous tissue, it could become muscle tissue, it could become skin tissue, it could become bone tissue, 
it really is multi -potent. Are we overstepping our boundaries once we start delving into these issues? Are we playing God? Now, unfortunately, that's a question that only you can answer for yourself. In fact, all of these ethical issues are only things that you can decide for yourself. In the exam, you're not likely to be asked to exert an opinion necessarily, but you are going to be asked what the ethical issue might be. The biggest of those is probably who makes these decisions? Does the doctor get to make the decision? What about the medical aid board? The medical aid board gets to make decisions about what sort of stem cells should be used. Obviously, they're going to make a decision that benefits them financially. And is that necessarily in the best interest of their clients? Do parents get to make that decision? If you have a child that's born with a disability or with some kind of genetic default, do you get to make that decision? Does the child get to make that decision? What about politicians? Politicians don't necessarily have the latest information. They're working on limited information. And do they really understand the implications and the issues at hand? So, if you're asked about the advantages and disadvantages relating to genetic engineering, there are a number of advantages. Firstly, we can get the trait that we're looking for. So we can increase the yield for food. And food security, if you remember from your human impact section that you studied in grade 11, that is a big deal. Disease resistant, drought tolerant, all of these things are particularly relevant in today's society. Using genetic engineering can actually be quicker in the long run, which means that you can get the product out there much faster. We can save an endangered species, and that's happening all over the world in zoos at the moment. Endangered species are being mated together, and genetic engineering is being used to try and save them from extinction. We could, as I mentioned earlier, provide body parts if you need an organ transplant. You may remember a few years back, there was a three-year-old girl who was very badly burnt in a, in a paraffin fire here in the Cape. Doctors in the US were able to take some of her stem cells and grow her her own skin. The skin was then transported from the US back to South Africa, and she's undergone a number of operations to replace her burnt skin because she had third degree burns all over her body, to replace her burnt skin with her own skin grown for her in a lab. It was obviously a very, very expensive operation, uh, not only to manufacture the skin, but to get it here and to, to get it here fast enough that it could be transplanted onto her body. She will have scars for the rest of her life, but she has her own skin again. What about those who are unable to have children? With our trends at the moment of people starting families much, much later, the quality of the egg and the sperm is, is much poorer with the result that fertility rates are dropping significantly in certain sectors of the world. If you are no, not able to start a family, but you are financially in a position to do so, then this could be a solution. One of the major uh, fields of research at the moment is looking at using the CRISPR process, which allows us to infect someone with a virus that has been modified and that virus attacks a particular organ or a particular type of cell and modifies the DNA, fixing a problem that is there. For example, let's say you have diabetes and you have diabetes of the type where your cells do not produce insulin. Well, if we could use CRISPR and a vector, we could modify the DNA in your entire pancreas to make it start producing insulin for you. That means no more injections. That means no more risk of death. It means a saving financially for years of having to buy insulin. There are a whole lot of genetic disorders that potentially we could cure using genetic modification. But there are a whole bunch of disadvantages. So from a moral standpoint, many people would say we're overstepping our boundaries here and we're playing God. We're interfering in nature. And if we were to save everybody who has a disease or a disorder, overpopulation would go even more through the roof than it has already. Any testing of animals is cruel. That's just the way it is. And many people feel that we shouldn't be testing on animals at all. 
genetic modification has to be tested on animals first before it can be tested on humans. And so many people are against genetic engineering for that reason. It does have the potential to decrease genetic diversity. And that is a problem if the environment changes. Think back to your natural selection section when we get there. Um, Darwin's theory of natural selection is that the fittest individual is the one that is going to survive the change in the environment and pass on its genes to its offspring. But if there's very little variation, then when the environment changes, there's a really good possibility that species will not be able to change or adapt because they don't have the, the wide enough or they don't have a wide enough variation in their genes. In general, cloning, if you remember in grade 10, you did cloning, which is genetic modification. Clones are more likely to develop problems such as accelerated aging, a weak immune system, an abnormal size, and increased risk of cancer. We're further down the line now in terms of our use of technology. And so these, those particular disadvantages have been minimized, but they do still occur. And that's a lot of money to spend on something that isn't going to be around for very long. At the moment, genetic modification is extremely expensive. Uh, it really is not something that is available to the every Joe man on the street. One of the major disadvantages from an ethical perspective is that parents may produce more offspring to try and save the lives of existing offspring, uh, producing body parts, etc. If you are a reader, if you're a first language English speaker particularly, you might enjoy the Jodie Picoult book called My Sister's Keeper, which delves into this very specific issue where a family have a, a child who has a genetic disorder, they have a second child to try and harvest cell, stem cells from her, to try and harvest organs from her, to save her older sister's life. It's well worth a read. And then obviously, any kind of experimentation and research generates experimental waste. And how do we deal with that additional waste, given the amount of waste that we as a species on this planet are already producing? Again, think of your human impact section from grade 11. These are some existing genetically modified organisms. The pomato is a tomato above ground and a potato below ground. This reduces the amount of land that is required to produce crops. Instead of having one field that produces tomatoes and a second field that produces potatoes, you can grow both crops in the same field because it's one plant producing two different crops. The aquavantage salmon uh, in the front, in the foreground, is a natural salmon, and in the back is an aquavantage salmon. They've been bred to be bigger. Uh, and more robust, and therefore fewer fish need to be caught. Given that our fish stocks are declining globally, potentially this could solve the problem uh, of the fish stock problem. Bottom right, the enviro pig. Now, pigs, if you've ever been to a pig farm, you will know that they produce a lot of waste, and it's incredibly smelly waste, and that's because of the phosphates that are present in their waste. Pigs are not able to digest uh, certain compounds very easily, with the result that the poo they produce, their excrement, is very, very high in phosphates. Again, in your human impact section, grade 11, you learned about eutrophication, where nutrients wash off the land into the oceans, into the rivers, uh, causing algal blooms that then kills everything. Poo from pigs is very high in phosphates, and that's exactly what it does. So these enviro pigs have been genetically modified. They've been provided an enzyme which they now can produce, which allows them to digest those phosphates much more efficiently. And so the poo they produce has much lower phosphate levels in it. And in the middle, probably one of my favorites, is a vaccine banana. Hepatitis B is something that you should have been vaccinated against as a child. But now imagine that you're living in the middle of Africa, in a rural environment far from any city, somewhere along the equatorial region. Vaccines have to be uh, refrigerated. If they are not refrigerated, if they get too warm, they break down and then they're useless. How do you vaccinate children who are living in rural environments, in small villages, in the equatorial region or in any hot region in the world where a vaccine would need to be refrigerated 
in transport. It's very, very expensive to do. And so this banana has been genetically modified to produce the hepatitis B vaccine without refrigeration being necessary. So literally, you grow these bananas, you harvest them, you put them in the back of your truck, and you head off to the local village and hand them out to all the kids. The kids each eat a banana and they've been vaccinated. It's as simple as that. All of these examples that I've shown you are what are called genetically modified organisms. They've had an addition of a gene into their DNA, and that gene comes from some other species. The wheat that we produce in South Africa is all genetically modified. Uh, many of our bananas are modified. Rice in China has been modified. It produces additional vitamin D. Apologies, vitamin D. Cloning, as I said, is something that you've studied in grade 10. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because this should be familiar to you. This is just a recap for you. Three types of cloning that we can do, DNA, reproductive, and therapeutic. DNA cloning is the creation of a transgenic organism. So that's where we use the CRISPR and we create a bacterium or a virus that has a human gene in it or whatever other gene added to it in order to produce a product. Reproductive cloning is where we clone an entire organism and therapeutic cloning is where we produce human embryos and human stem cells for research purposes. So this is what DNA cloning looks like, just to refresh your memory. Again, we did this in grade 10. We slice out the gene that we want. So in human beings, that would be the production of insulin. That gene we then insert into a bacterial plasmid. And when we, we stick the ends back together using ligase, we get recombinant DNA. That plasmid, that is the recombinant DNA, we put that back into the virus or back into the bacterium. And we then allow that bacterium to just multiply itself up. You are likely to be given a question on the use of DNA cloning to produce insulin. When we produce insulin, we use bacteria. And those bacteria sit in a dish on a lab bench and produce their insulin. It's very easy to do. It's very cheap to do. The quality of the insulin that you get at the end is much better because you can very closely monitor and control the process. And it's easy to purify and package. Reproductive cloning, and you can see there bottom right, the first successful reproductive clone was Dolly the sheep. And in South Africa, the first successful reproductive clone was Pooty the cow. What we do with reproductive cloning is that we have usually three parents. One parent provides a nucleus from a body cell, from a somatic cell. One sheep, a female, or one parent, a female, must produce the egg that then gets used, but we remove the nucleus. And the third parent is the surrogate into whose uterus this zygote, in essence, will be implanted and will grow to full term. So the process, we take an ordinary body cell, can be any body cell from the one parent, and we remove the nucleus. The nucleus is all that we want. From the second parent, we remove the egg cell. And then we take the nucleus out and throw it away. So we take this nucleus with this egg cell and we fuse them together and by zapping it with a little bit of electricity, the cell, the egg cell, thinks it's been fertilized and it then becomes a zygote. That zygote then continues the normal mitotic division to form your blastocyst and your marula, or marula and then blastocyst. And that we then implant into the uterus. We do uh, artificial fertilization in essence. And we implant it into the uterus and that little zygote then grows to a fully mature or, uh, organism which gets born in the normal way. Therapeutic cloning, this is the hope of the world. Uh, it does require human embryos, and obviously there are ethical issues around that. All right, let's move on and talk about paternity testing, trying to find out who the father is of a child. Because most of you have watched some kind of medical drama or some kind of soapy where there is a paternity test episode, 
you have been exposed to some of the most recent research on paternity testing, which is that mothers are not needed for a paternity test. In actual fact, our paternity tests now are so good that you only need the child and the potential biological father. And you're able to determine with a 98% certainty whether that father is the father of the child or not. However, in the exam, you must state that both mother and father are needed. The way that the department wants you to answer this question is to say that you compare the DNA of the child to the mother and you eliminate 50% of the child's DNA as a result because that matches with the mother. And then you look at the remaining 50% of the child's DNA and see if that matches the father. And the reason for that is because they want you to use a monohybrid cross. They will build this into a monohybrid cross kind of question. Um, they want you thinking along the lines of the monohybrid cross, which requires mother and father. Also, please note, the potential father is not a suspect. If you use the word suspect, it indicates that you are confusing using DNA profiling to test for a criminal and using uh, a paternity test to determine whether a father is actually the biological father or not. So with paternity testing, what we do is we usually look at blood groups uh, and you would need to be able to do a monohybrid cross for any of these combinations. It's worth practicing them. You could also be asked to look at a DNA profile. If you look at this DNA profile now, you can see that the mother and the child share a significant number. In fact, 50% of the child's DNA matches the mother's DNA. And then you've got two potential fathers, man A and man B. Which of those do you think is the child's biological father? 50% of the child's bands, as I said, match the mother. The remaining 50% match man B. If you look at man A, there are a couple of bands that do match with the child. But the number of bands that match between man A and the child and man B and the child indicates quite heavily that man B has a greater commonality. There are more bars in common with man B than with man A, and therefore man B is considered the father. The last section to cover in our genetics section is looking at genetic links. This links in with your evolution section and tracing evolutionary history. We look at mitochondrial DNA. In reproduction, when a sperm and an egg fuse, the sperm injects its nucleus into the egg cell. Its mitochondria, which is sitting in the neck of the sperm cell, does not enter the egg cell, with the result that all the mitochondria that an individual has comes from its mother. By looking at the mitochondrial DNA, therefore, we can determine the matrilineal line of inheritance. The other thing about mitochondrial DNA is that it behaves very differently to nuclear DNA. Firstly, it has less variation in it. There are fewer alleles for each of the genes that are on the mitochondrial DNA. Secondly, the mutation rate of mitochondrial DNA is much lower than that of nuclear DNA. And that is because there's actually very little crossing over. In fact, there's no crossing over of mitochondrial DNA when cells divide. The result of that is the mitochondrial DNA does not change very much from generation to generation. That means that you are able to trace your genetic links using your mitochondrial DNA to your mother, your grandmother, your great grandmother, etc. Similarly, the Y chromosomal DNA can be used to trace genetic links. Obviously, being found in males only and being non homologous with the X chromosome, it doesn't do crossing over. That means that it also remains relatively unchanged through generation. And so you can use that to trace back from child to father to great grandfather, great grandfather, etc. In general, with both mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosomal DNA, when we do a DNA analysis of that, the following things are true. The more similar the samples are, the closer the relationship between the individuals. If there is a lot of variation between the two samples, if there's decreased similarity, then it means that the individuals are distantly related to each other. What's interesting to note is that geographical populations share more similarities. So African populations, for example, share many more similarities in both of these types of DNA than 
they do with Asian populations. And then lastly, if you have a mutation, or if there is a very specific difference, that can help you to trace the specific uh, disease or disorder back in your generation to see where it comes from, who has it, and who might still have it. That brings us to the end of the theory video on genetics. Don't forget that there is a past paper question video with worked examples for the content that was covered in today's video.